This is the R Podcast, Episode 5, Basic Package Management. everybody and welcome back to the art podcast my name is eric nance and i'm the host of the podcast and just right off the bat this episode has been recorded about a week later than i anticipated and that was just due to some crazy uh schedule at work a lot of things need to be done so anyway back back at it this week and um without further ado i just wanted to get to a couple of newsworthy items before we get to the listener feedback the biggest uh, news story within R itself is we have a new version released. This is version 2.15.0, and it's been called Easter Beagle. That's kind of an interesting name, but um, it does feature a few key enhancements that have been made, especially towards one of the packages that are included now within the installation called the Parallel Package. And this is somewhat appropriate since we'll be talking about packages in the main main topic today. But um, there's there's a complete list of all the new features and any associated fixes that have been found for this release. And I'll put a link in the show notes from the CRAN website that has all this information. So with that, I think let's get right into some listener feedback. Message for you, son. Okay, so our first listener feedback comes from Aaron. Aaron writes, Hi, I just wanted to say that I think the audio cast is awesome. Please keep it in audio format. I listen to it whenever I go somewhere. And continue the good work. It would be cool to see stuff on packages such as ggplot2, iGraph, Traminer, and would also be great to learn how to interact with SQL databases and how to pull data from online sources, such as Twitter, GitHub, Wikipedia, etc. Also, if you wanted to do it, if you wanted to, it would be awesome to have a more in-depth look at how to do programming in R, something similar to the Art of R programming book. Best, Aaron. Well, thanks a lot, Aaron. That was some very nice feedback, and I definitely agree, and I am going to visit using such nice packages. As I mentioned earlier in the episodes before this, I'm a big fan of especially that ggplot2 package for visualization. And you also include some other nice packages I'd like to explore in the future. And in the very near future, we're gonna be talking about importing data from other sources. And yeah, I've had experience with getting data from SQL before, and I'll definitely be talking about that and some of the other nice sources especially these days with more people pulling data from online sources i mean as i read you know some of the blogs about r there's been a lot of traffic lately about pulling data from twitter itself so that's something we'll probably explore as well and lastly i am also a huge fan of the art of programming book and i am just i read that a lot just to refresh my skills but it also has some really nice topics that have not really been addressed in previous R books, especially from more of a programming perspective. And that actually is quite important as you start to develop more kind of serious and in-depth R scripts. It really gives you some really nice skills to, you know, hone and master. So yeah, you can you can bet I'll be kind of pulling some of those topics and probably expanding on them in future episodes. So thanks a lot, Aaron. Our next feedback comes from Kent. Kent writes, I love your show. It fills a gap that I've been waiting for someone to fill. Just as friendly feedback, it seems that most very successful podcasts have more interaction and interviews. While you do a great job, it might be nice for a change of voice occasionally. I certainly am not writing this email for any other purpose than to offer this feedback. But I did my first presentation on R last night, and I used some of your show notes as a model as I prepared. 
the link is, and he, he gives a link in, in the email, which I'll put in the show notes, if you think anyone would be interested. Keep up the very fine work, Kent. Well, thanks very much, Kent. And you know what? I first uh, talk about your point about the interaction and interviews. That is something I definitely want to start incorporating more. And getting first with the listener interaction, I think this is starting with this episode and beyond. It's probably a good time for me to request and propose a new feature that I'll have on the show for every episode. And I'd like this to actually come from content from all of you listeners out there. I'm proposing to have a segment each episode called Listener Tips. And what I would like to have, and I've seen this, you know, um, used on some other nice podcasts, especially about Linux, is that a user will submit a short audio clip or audio feedback about just something they have learned or something they use in, say, their daily routine that has made their use of R more optimal or just is something that they've really, you know, benefited from. So I'm kind of hoping that for those of you listening that I'd be encourage you to, you know, maybe record a short audio tip, you know, via whatever setup you have, or even better, if you want to call the voicemail hotline and leave a listener tip on there, I'd be glad to play those on future episodes and let this be a segment that I get content from you, the listeners, as I think that would be a really nice way to really, you know, bring this interaction to another level. So I definitely appreciate that point, Kent. And as far as interviews go, yeah, that is something that down the road I definitely want to explore because I've already kind of have in my in my notes anyway a, a list of those from the R community that I'd really like to talk with in depth about some of their work because I think it would really benefit the audience of the show and not to mention myself as I'm really kind of fascinated by what all these uh, brilliant minds are doing. So definitely stay tuned for that because that's something I definitely want to, you know, do somewhere down the road. And yeah, actually I did um, check out your presentation and for all, all of you out there, his presentation was called R Fell on Alabama last night and it was given at the Birmingham Open Source Society back later in March. And I must say it was a very nice presentation. And I'll definitely, as I said, I'll put a link to the presentation in the show notes because I think all of our listeners will definitely enjoy seeing that as well. So thanks a lot, Kent. So with that, I think it's time to get to the main topic, basic package management. So yeah, this is talking about, you know, how to really interact with R as far as, you know, installing and getting to know these different packages that are available. And as I mentioned, I think back in the very first episode of the R podcast, the the availability of these community contributed packages is arguably one of my top features that has, you know, made me enjoy R so much is the fact that we can take advantage of all these really brilliant and powerful contributions proposed by those in the R community. And first, uh, I've, I'm going to structure this discussion basically answering kind of some key questions from a new user perspective and then give some tips I've learned along the way of kind of getting more information. So I think first, let's start right at the top with what exactly is a package? Well, you can think of it as really a way to extend the basic capabilities that R already comes with and that provide additional functionality via, say, new functions, maybe new data sets, and of course, documentation on these functions and this as far as what these things can be it can be just about anything for example we have so many packages now that are dedicated to visualization of course we have others dedicated to importing different types of data and of course you'll see many packages dealing with some really new statistical methodologies and that's really just scratching the surface as far as the wealth of possibilities that these packages can offer and also, you can, you can think of this as 
you know, for example, I use the Firefox browser for a lot of my internet browsing needs. And those of you who have used that will know that you can add what are called these add-ons or extensions that give Firefox additional functionality, but you can do that like within Firefox itself. Well, the nice thing is, as you'll hear later on, is we can get these new packages and install them within R itself, and it's actually quite easy, and you'll see later on, or you'll hear later on what I mean by that. Um, now, I'll, I'll talk about some more kind of logistics around the packages themselves. You'll, you'll notice that when you see a package on CRAN, and I'll talk about that shortly, there are going to be kind of multiple formats of them, but they're all going to be some kind of compressed file. Um, the very basic version is what's called the compressed source code, and this is contained in what's called a tarball file, and that's a file that has extension .tar.gz. And what this is, is actually the package's source code right there, and it hasn't really been what we call compiled yet, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But then on the package website, you'll also see likely two other versions of packages, one for Windows, and this is kind of the Windows, what's called the binary version, and that has an extension .zip or .zip, which is very familiar to Windows users. And also for the Mac platform, there will be a, a version of the package ending in .tgz as well. And like I said, these are what we call binaries of these packages. So next, someone might want to know, when you install these packages, where are they going exactly? Well, within R, it has a set of directory or directories in some cases called libraries. And the job of these libraries is just basically to house the package files so that R can know where to go to to load the package's functionality when the user requests it. Um, as far as where this library actually is, um, it'll kind of vary from the different operating systems. For example, in the Windows platform, the library folder will be within the R program file directory. So just if you're, say, running on Windows XP, for example, this might be in C, program files, R, and then there will be a directory called library. Um, and then in the Linux platform, and I, maybe the Macintosh as well, there will be another set of directory that's just specific to libraries itself, and oftentimes there will be multiple ones as well. Now, I'm not going to really get into the nitty-gritty of where exactly those are because sometimes it differs by the Linux distribution and everything, but the bottom line is these libraries are basically the place where packages are going to be contained. So next, someone a question may come up is, so you've heard about these packages, but how do you know, or what's a way you can check which packages do you currently have on your R installation? So that, now we're gonna get into some interesting things you can do within R itself to answer this question. The first of which is run a function that's simply called library. And you can run this function and just do not put any arguments in it. You can just do the open and close parenthesis. And what this will give you is a new window will pop up that will have all the packages that are installed on your system. And you'll see that this window will organize the packages based on which library the packages are installed in. And in my case, when I run R on some of my Ubuntu flavored Linux operating systems, I actually have multiple libraries that these packages are in. If it's, say, a package that came from when I first installed R, or if it's a package I've installed afterwards just using what I'm about to talk about shortly as for how to install specific packages. So that's, uh, that's one very quick way for you to check what packages are actually on your system at this time. 
And then there's also additional functions, one in particular called the installed.packages function that will actually return to you a matrix that has detailed information about each package that's installed. And you can do some kind of nice things as far as subsetting this and looking at the available information. And I'll put like a short little script, R script, um, that has kind of how I use this function on our GitHub repository page. And you'll see that in the show notes. So those are really just the two easiest ways, in my opinion, to check which packages you have installed currently on your system. So as, as I've talked about how to check what's on your system, well, the good news is, is that when you install R for the first time and you, you say run it and you haven't done anything else, the good news is, is that the default installation of R already comes with a selected collection of packages. And I'll put a link in the show notes to what's called the R FAQ that actually has a complete list of these default packages. And one concept to keep in mind is that when you run R and launch it in whatever OS you're running, what you'll see is that not all the packages are actually loaded into your system that are available. And the reason this is, it's actually both kind of a design philosophy and also just, I think, logistics as well. But from what I've read, the R developers made really a, a conscious decision to kind of minimize, say, the memory footprint that R has when you begin to run it in that it will only load at, at launch what's absolutely necessary to just begin your basic usage of R. And for example, you, you can verify that some of the packages loaded by default include what's called the base package. And this is kind of like, in my opinion, the real heart of R itself. But then there are some other packages, for example, data sets, which actually is a package that gives you access to a bunch of built-in data sets that you can experiment with right away. Some other packages include graphics, methods, stats, and that would actually contain most of the, the default statistical functionality, and utils, which I believe is kind of more of utility type functions that you can interact with, say your operating system or other aspects about R itself. And so these are the type of packages that are loaded by default. And I would definitely not recommend trying to change that because you need those to basically do anything else in R, I would say. And actually there's a configuration parameter that contains this kind of list of packages and that parameter is called default packages. And in the in future episodes, I'll talk about ways that we can kind of customize R itself in that one of the ways you could customize this is by adding additional packages that you could load at startup. But that's kind of beyond the scope of today's episode, but I'll be talking about that in the future. But what's I think really cool about R is that it actually tries to minimize kind of the overhead as far as using R itself with your your system as far as the memory use and everything right from the start and that really the user themselves can tell R if they want to use say another specific package in their session then R the way R works is you'll load that into your session and I'll get into how to do that shortly. But that's just one thing to keep in mind is that some new users may wonder, well, I installed this new package, but when I launched R again, I can't use it yet. Well, that's because you'll have to load it into the R session first. But I wanted to address one other uh, key topic before we get into those kind of details is, okay, now we've been talking about packages, but one question I get a lot, especially from new users, is how do you find these packages? How do you know about them? Well, there's a, actually quite a few uh, sources to get this information from. So I'm going to talk about the, the ones that kind of are the, the real basics as well as some relatively newer sources. So first of all, 
the CRAN or the Comprehensive R Archive Network has a list of all these available packages. And if you go to the CRAN website, you'll see, and that's of course cran.r-project.org, you'll see on the left hand side an entry for packages. And once you navigate to that, you'll be able to get to a list of all the available packages on the CRAN repository. And these can be sorted in either alphabetical order or even by date of publication. So like what's been added most recently, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you, if you, when you see that list, you'll see, of course, each package has basically a hyperlink to like its own special page on CRAN. And this is where you could actually find the necessary details about a package itself. And this has been kind of standardized by the R developers so that each package's page on CRAN follows the same format and has basically the same information. So you'll see information, for example, about the author of the package, who's maintaining it, what version it is currently. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, you'll see the actual compressed files that contain the R, I mean, the particular package's files, both the source version and the binary versions. And what's nice also is that there will be a PDF link to the package's reference manual, which is basically a PDF of all the help pages for all the package uh, functions that are contained in that package. So even before you install a package, you can go to CRAN and actually read about what's offered in that package. And at least of many of the packages now especially will have another website that's more developed by the authors themselves that either will explain the package or have some more interesting information. Um, and then what's not necessarily required but what's actually really nice to have is that some packages will offer what are called vignettes and what these are, are, you could think of it as like a research article or some kind of more verbalized description or more verbose description of how the package works and kind of using it in real practice. But it could also be a vignette that describes maybe the statistical methodology behind the package. You know, it could be any of those things. And I've always enjoyed being able to read about those as I'm kind of figuring out if this package will suit my needs or not. So, of course, I've talked about this kind of listing of packages, and as I mentioned before, and I believe this is the case still now, there are over 3,700 packages, I think, that are available, so it's kind of daunting to go through the listing that way. But there are a couple kind of nicer enhancements or nicer ways to find packages as well. One way in which that CRAN has what's called a task views section, which will actually kind of break down selected packages into categories. And this is really nice because you'll see categories of, for example, uh, visualization. You'll see a category for what's called machine learning algorithms. And th that's actually been some methodologies I've been looking at a lot more recently. Um, you'll see uh, task view entries on high performance computing, for example. So any packages that can help R tap into the power of today's hardware of, say, multiple processors or, or, or more memory or ways of dealing with these added kind of hardware features. Or, but it's much more than that. But there are, of course, many other task views as well. So if you kind of know the general area of what maybe a package you're looking for is in, let's say you were interested in a machine learning package that could help you do what's called the random forest classification. Well, that would be right in that machine learning task view. And you'll see that there's, for each of these task views, there's like one maintainer that's kind of keeping all this information up to date. And like I said, it's a really nice way to kind of get a feel for what's offered in these add-on packages for a certain topic. Now, I wish I could say that this was an exhaustive list, but unfortunately, it pro I know it's not gonna be able to include absolutely everything, and I'm sure there are other categories that are not reflected here. But 
as a reference, it's still a really nice uh, page to visit. So I, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind is that these, these pa- versions of packages that are on what's called the CRAN repository that I've been referring to are what I would refer to as like the stable versions of these packages. And these are the ones that in order to get on CRAN, a package developer has to basically submit their package to that. And the, the maintainers of CRAN will actually check that package and make sure everything from a technical perspective is working correctly for like installation and other issues. And there are probably a lot more details of that. And actually I know firsthand because a couple of years ago, I actually helped co-author a package. So I went through the process for the first time in, in those years. And yeah, it was actually really smooth. But what's nice is the CRAN maintainers will do all that checking for you. And then when it's in essence approved, it will be posted on that package's CRAN webpage. So, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that there are actually other sources that hold maybe what are more referred to as developmental versions of packages. And I'll talk about a couple that I know of just from firsthand experience, but I must say there probably are more than this. So just take that um, with a grain of salt. But um, the first uh, source I want to mention is what's called R Forge, and I'll put a link to this in the show notes as well. But this has basically been started since I believe the year 2007, and its its goal is to provide a repository for developers of these R packages to kind of you know enhance the collaboration of development of the package, you know, say the source code and other issues, so that they all can have one central place to go to to make all their changes and have what's called version control and also keep track of you know bugs in a package and even be able to make like a custom web page that has more information on the package itself and when i checked uh recently before recording this episode i believe there are now more than 1200 projects and when I say projects, yeah, the majority of these are going to be R packages, but you also see sometimes it's actually new software that's not necessarily a package but may have some other kind of interaction with R. And then there are, I think, over 4,700 users that are registered on R Forge. And actually, when I helped co-author that package a couple of years ago, I was one of them. So I, I actually put the developmental code on R Forge. And since then, and I, I learned about the other the reference I'm going to talk about next is more recent. And actually, I've been using it for the purposes of the code on this podcast. But that's, of course, called GitHub. And I mentioned before, GitHub has got the slogan social coding. But what I've noticed lately is that in addition to, say, people like me who are kind of sharing some code for a specific purpose and for my purpose of course is this podcast but there are other developers that are putting their package source code on github and i have really become a big fan of what features github can offer as far as of course sharing your your um history of you know how should i say this enhancements to the source code You can also pull a lot more detailed information for how the package works. And it's just a really clean and I would say very easy to use interface. And I I admit I'm actually thinking of perhaps porting over what I have on RForge over the GitHub just because it's actually, from my perspective, a lot easier to interact with GitHub than it is RForge now. But like I said, that may be a matter of preference. Obviously, I'm, I don't want to get into package development here. But anyway, I just wanted to let you know that GitHub is another kind of more newer, but I would say getting very popular as far as housing other versions of a package. So I would definitely check that out sometime. And while to kind of wrap up how you find packages, if it's not on say a CRAN task view and it's hard to find one based on the name of a package itself from the CRAN listing, 
I'd invite you to use what I mentioned before in episodes, kind of the Google for R, and that's rseq.org. I would definitely just type in the query, the search box there, maybe the general idea of what you want to accomplish for finding a package. And I would say in the first few hits from that result of those results, you'll likely be taken to either a CRAN page or at least some other web page that describes perhaps a package that you're looking for. So I would definitely keep rseq.org in your bookmarks as far as finding you know, additional packages that might be interesting to you. And actually, there are a couple other resources I want to mention as well. Um, there was a, I would say, a community kind of driven website that was developed, if I recall correctly, from one of those uh, Google Summer of Code projects. And that's called Crantastic. And that's at Crantastic, that's C-R-A-N-T-A-S-T-I-C. .org. And what's it, it's kind of like CRAN in a sense that it will list all the available packages, but it has some other interesting enhancements from more of a community perspective where you can kind of tag packages, kind of like how we tag, you know, blogs and things like that. But more, more fascinating to me is that it actually allows users to put reviews of packages, which you cannot do with just the default CRAN page of a package and there are there are actually some packages that have a lot of reviews now admittedly I kind of hope that those in the R community will at least visit this site a little more often because to me if I'm new to R if I was just starting with R now you know I might view finding a package as like finding something to buy online or finding a piece of software and that I kind of want to see how whatever users think of it. So Crantastic, I think its goal was to kind of give all of us in the R community a way of, you know, providing feedback that everyone could share in as far as reviewing packages, giving them some ratings, etc. So I would definitely check that out if you're interested in seeing how that works. And the last little resource I'll mention is one I discovered very recently it's kind of a list of like the top packages in terms of criteria that are based on a, in part this uh, Crantastic website and also a website called Inside R that's maintained by Revolution Computing. And the URL is a little difficult to describe verbally, but it's basically a list that's generated from what's called the Unknown R package. And it actually has a nice kind of ranking list of what based on their criteria, are like the most popular packages at the moment. And if I recall from my last viewing, ggplot2 is at the top of the list. But it's got some other interesting packages that actually I may check out just based on the, the results it's showing. So I'll put a link to this kind of list in the, in the show notes as well. So we, we talked a lot about kind of those details about packages. Now let's get to really the next question everyone's going to ask who's new to R is, okay, now I found a package. How do I install it? Well, here's the good news is that R itself has built-in functionality to enable users from within R itself to actually uh, automate, in essence, the whole process of downloading a package, um, doing whatever it needs to do from a system level, and then basically installing it and having it ready for you to use. So let me talk about a couple of different ways of doing it. Let's first talk about the way of, if you're on a stable internet connection, of the way you can interact directly with CRAN itself to get the packages. So um, what you'll do is, depending on how you're running R, you can do it a couple of different ways. Um, if you're running those are GUIs that come standard with, say, the Windows and the Mac installations, you'll see there are menus at the top that have like a category called Packages, and you'll want to choose the option Install Packages from that menu. What you'll see is you're prompted to choose what's called a CRAN mirror, and this is similar to when you installed R for the first time and you chose on the web page for that installation, hopefully you chose a mirror that was close to your physical location. 
you're kind of doing the same thing here. And once you choose that, let's say I chose a mirror from the, um, oh, let's say one of the California mirrors, for example. And then once I chose that, then I would see a list pop up of, ba of all the available packages. And what I would do is I would scroll through that and highlight the entry for the package I'm looking for. Let's say, for example, I was looking for a ggplot2. I would find that in the, in the list, highlight it, and just click OK. And then you'll see some text on the screen of our installing that package. And hopefully, as long as you don't see any errors from it, it'll basically exit out saying it's been unpacked and in essence ready to use. And so that's, that's a real easy way of doing it. And actually, as I mentioned before, I've been using RStudio lately, and RStudio also has a way for you to install packages via its menus. For example, if I recall, it's in the Tools menu, and you'll see an entry called Install Packages. And then in this, in this case, you'll, you can just type the name of the package in a text box, and what I think it will do, it'll actually kind of auto-complete the name for you if you start typing, then you can kind of select it. And then you'll click install and then, yeah, you'll have the package ready to go there too. Now, the, the universal way that works on no matter what platform you're running is using the function called install.packages. And the argument you'll want to put in this function is basically the name of the package itself surrounded by quotes. And actually, I can elaborate a little bit further is that this argument is in essence a character vector of corresponding to the name of the package you want installed. So that's why you're putting that the word of or the name of the package in quotes. Now, what's nice about this is you could actually put multiple packages in one call of it, but just put those names of packages in, you know, wrapped around say the C function, you know, how you create vectors and you can install multiple packages in one call. Now, one thing that I haven't really touched on that I should mention here is that by default, what R will do when you install packages this way is that if there are packages that your particular package depends on, what is often referred to as dependencies, R will actually fetch those dependencies for you without you having to go ahead and find those yourself and actually rerunning install packages and getting those. It will by default get those necessary packages for you that, so you can install not only the package you're interested in but also what it depends on. Otherwise it would be difficult then to run the package you're looking for because R might complain that it's missing a dependency. For that particular package. So that's that's nice that R does that by default for you. Um, and recall that I mentioned recently that some packages are also housed on what's called that R Forge website, that alternate repository. Now let's say you had found a package on that website and you're interested in installing that version of a package and maybe that package isn't even available on CRAN. Well, you can still do this from within R by in the in the install.packages function. After you put the name of the package, you also want to put in an argument called repos. That's R E P O S equal, and then you would put in quotes the actual link to R Forge itself. So that will be the same link I'll put in the show notes, and that will tell R that okay, don't go to CRAN for it, go to R Forge to find this package. So that's that's just a nice way of you know util, utilizing that alternate repository if you find a package on there. Now one one caveat I'll make, and this is for basically all the Linux users out there, especially people like me who use Linux daily for their for their um, R use, is that if you were installing a package and you want this package available system wide, i.e., if you had multiple user accounts that they could use the package as well. Be sure to run R as a root user and then use, say, the install.packages function within that session of R and then exit out barring any major issues. And once you do that, then when you run R as a normal user, no matter which user you're, you are, 
you will be able to load that package into your session. It won't just be available for one particular user because if you don't run it as root, R will install packages into your home directory. And that for most distributions is always kind of off limits for other users. So that's just a heads up to those of you out there that are running R on the Linux platform. Now, one thing that's also sometimes necessary is that you may need to, from time to time, install a package from its actual file itself. And in essence, not using the way I've just mentioned. Um, the reason you might want to have to do that, or you might have to do this, is I've noticed very infrequently, but it can happen, that for whatever reason, when R was downloading the package from within R itself to install, that sometimes the download can be corrupted, for example. And this can happen no matter what you're downloading online. Sometimes things just happen, and whether it's your connection or whether it's you know the site issue. So anyway, there may be cases where you might want to install a package directly from its associated file. So what you would want to do is you want to go to the package's website on, on CRAN. Let's say I want to install um, a package ggplot2 from its file. For, depending on my operating system, I would download the appropriate kind of version of that package. So let's say I'm running it on Windows, I would download the .zip version of that package. I would download it to the system, and then when I launch R, I would I would um I could do this a couple of different ways. In the R GUI for Windows, there will be an entry in the packages menu that says install from local zip file or something to that effect. And then you can simply browse to the zip file corresponding to the package and then it would install it for you. Or you can run the install.packages function again. But now all you do is that the first argument would be file equal and then you would put in quotes the path to that, that uh, zip file in your system. And this method of doing it would actually work on any operating system because you would just substitute the appropriate file to download and just run this function, as I mentioned, and then just browse to that file itself. So that's, like I said, it, you may not need to do that, especially if you're just beginning R, but in case you do, that's how you would do it. Now, what I'm not going to elaborate too much on is if you're running on, say, the Windows or the Mac platform, as you've seen, they have special versions of the package file tailored to that operating system. And those are what we call binary versions of those packages. And what that means is that everything that had to be, say, compiled to get the package ready for installation has already been done for you. And all you have to do is install the package from that binary file. And most of the time, like 99% of the time, that will work without a problem. Now, for those of you that are interested in maybe installing a source version of a package um, and you're running on, say, Windows, Windows by itself won't be able to let you do that. You'll need a collection of tools, and these are called R tools. And I'm speaking, again, specific to the Windows platform. And this is a suite of tools that actually, it, to be honest, come mostly by default in Linux installations, but on Windows they don't. So you want to install this, this collection called R Tools and make sure you're using the version that corresponds to the version of R you're using. And there will be a link to the R Tools webpage in the show notes and that has a lot more information and documentation for how you would actually install a package from its source code version and that's again that dot tar dot gz version in general i don't recommend this for many users especially those that are new to r to do this this is more for those who are perhaps developing packages and like i said that's out of scope for today but i will be talking about package development in the future but that's just something to keep in mind if you wanted to install a package from a, a source file and notice I mentioned GitHub earlier as another uh, kind of new repository for housing these development versions of packages. If you're interested in installing a package from GitHub, 
I would recommend you download another package that's called Dev Tools, and this is actually authored by Hadley Wickham of the ggplot2 fame. And this is this package is on CRAN itself, so don't worry about having to get that from a different place. But that would let you, um, in essence, install a package from GitHub via what's called the install underscore GitHub function. And I'd recommend you take a look at the package documentation for more details. But I've actually started using that recently and it worked without a problem on my Linux installation. Now, if you're running on Windows, now given that the GitHub version of packages is like a source version of it, again, you're gonna need those R tools to be able to accomplish this. And Hadley mentions this, I believe, in the package documentation. So if you're interested in using these GitHub versions of packages, and you're on Windows, definitely get those R tools uh, collection installed first before you try this out. So yeah, that was that ended up being pretty long explanation on installing packages, but we're, the, the last few things I wanna wrap up on are of course, you've installed a package, but what happens is R by default will not load these new packages you've installed when you start it up in order to, to basically load a package into your R session, you're going to again want to use um, the library function. And in this case, when you call the library function, the first argument, just simply type the name of the package you want to load. And this time you don't have to put it in quotes, although you can, but you don't necessarily have to. So let's say you've installed the ggplot2 package in order to load it, just type library, parenthesis, ggplot2, close parenthesis, and this will load ggplot2 into your R session so you can start using its functions. And actually, there are other ways of loading packages depending on the way you're running R. For instance, in RStudio, what I really like about RStudio is that in the lower right panel, you'll see a, a pane where it has a tab called Packages, and when you click that tab, you'll see all your packages available are listed, and those that are loaded already have a checkbox next to it that's already checked. But let's say you found the ggplot2 entry and you want to load it, just click that checkbox. It's all done for you. And that's just a really you know easy way of doing it. And I know some of the other IDEs also have similar, I believe, functionality as well. And also the default GUIs from R that come with the Windows and the Mac installation, I believe also have entries to actually load the packages as well. And you would just choose from the list that pops up the available package that you wanna load and then just hit okay and I think that would be all done. But that's the key thing to keep in mind. Even though you install the package, you still have to load it into your R session to be able to start using it. Now let's say you've, you've loaded a package, but you can't quite remember what functions were in it and you just kind of want to get an idea again of what's available in it. Well, there's a, a real handy command that you can use no matter which way you're using R, and that's the help function. So you would type help, parenthesis. Now the argument you want to put in here is package equal, and then put in quotes the name of the package. So if you did this for say ggplot2, then you would see after you do that, a new window will pop up showing kind of what's available in that package. And you could click on the different function names, I believe, and then be able to just see how you run it. Now in our studio, again, this is really cool, but in that same package kind of tab that I told you about, if you click the, the name of that package, it's actually a hyperlink to like its package manual page and then you can basically click through and find for a particular function just click on that function and you'll see all that the help page and telling you of course the arguments everything of, of the details of that function and then that would be all set for you and also if you do this with our studio it also will link to you directly any of those vignettes that i mentioned that come with a package and that's a really nice way of just reading all that from within our studio itself. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that to everybody here as, as far as accessing a package information. Now let's say you, 
you finished whatever you want to do with a package in your current R session and you want to unload it. So to unload it, all you can, all you need to do is, um, no matter which way you're running R, you can run the detach function. And the argument here will be package equal and then the name of the package in quotes. And basically what this does is it tells your R session, okay, you're not going to use this package anymore for this particular session. So don't worry about keeping all of its function names, all of its data, all, all of its help information in memory. And so it will just kind of take it out of that R session. Now, don't worry, that didn't uninstall it. All it did was just for your particular R session say, I'm done with it and just unload it for me. And in R Studio, this is really easy. You just uncheck that checkbox next to the name of the package and that detaches it right there for you. So one thing is for those of you, of course, that are using whatever operating system you're using, we all know that from time to time our software is updated, whether it's the infamous Windows updates or even from the Linux side, some of the programs that we've installed will always have updates available via whatever package manager we're running. Well, the nice thing is, of course, is that within R itself, you can also update your packages as well. Because, of course, a package author is likely going to update their package maybe on a frequent basis or not so frequent. But uh, one example I'll mention, as I mentioned, I believe in the uh, last couple episodes, was that ggplot2 had a really... Um, how should I put this, an important update to version 0.9 that brought in a lot of additional functionality and it actually got a lot of attention on the blogosphere. And so let's say you had installed ggplot2 before that update and you heard all, the, all of us talking about it and you say, okay, I want to get that updated version. How do you do that? Well, what you would do is a couple of different ways is that no matter from the kind of command line interface within R, use the update.packages function. If you run this function and just put the open close parenthesis, i.e. you haven't defined any arguments, what this will do is that R will check from your installed version of a package and check on CRAN whether a later version is available. And it will do this for all the packages you have installed. And if it finds those that can be updated, it's going to prompt you to say, okay, this package, for example, ggplot2, would you like to update this package? And you'll have to answer either yes or no, or you would just type maybe a Y or an N. Now, this is what it does by default. But let's say instead of wanting to be asked about this for every package, maybe you just want to tell R, hey, I, if there's an updated version available, go get it. You don't have to ask me. Then in that update.packages function, make sure you use the argument prompt or ask, A-S-K, equal false. What this will do is it basically is telling R, don't ask you about updating a package. Just go ahead and do it. And this is handy in the case of if you haven't updated your packages for a long time, there could be, depending on how many packages you have in your system, a lot of updates available. And if you want to do this and kind of do something else for the next few minutes, you don't want to always have to type yes for all those updates. You just want to do it, you know, straight through. Now in the R GUIs on Windows and Mac, there are entries, I believe, in the packages menu that will let you update packages and similar to when the function having asking you for updates, it'll bring up a list of the packages that can be updated and you can highlight then the packages you want updated or perhaps highlight all of them and hit OK and then it will go ahead and update all of them. Um, and then RStudio will also have a menu for updating packages as well. And like I said, um, back for those of you Linux users out there, Again, make sure you're running R as root if you want to update your packages. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, so I have some more information um, on updating packages from the, the R manuals online from the, from the R development team. And I'll put that link in the show notes. And one thing I'll mention is that if you've upgraded your version of R, 
let's say you upgraded from the last version 2.14 to 2.15 recently. If you're running on Windows, the way R does this is that the library is kind of contained within each actual version of R, i.e. there's a library directory where all, all the packages are within that folder corresponding to version 2.14.2. But then when you install version 2.15, by default, R's library for that version of R is within that 2.15 directory. Now, for me personally, I've upgraded R on Windows quite a lot, and I got a little tired of basically having to reinstall packages when I upgraded a new version because they weren't basically copied over from the old version to the new version. Well, the good news is that um, I can't remember how long ago it was, but I still use this to this day. But Tal Galili, who of course is the maintainer of R bloggers, also has his own personal R blog called the R Statistics blog. And he did a post about strategies for upgrading R on Windows. And also he wrote functions that basically will create a library directory that's not contained within each individual R installation, but above that, so that whenever you upgrade R, he'll, he has functions that let you basically automate the process of getting this library created, and also, after it's been created, of basically querying CRAN for the updates and doing it all for you. So I'll definitely be putting this link in the show notes because it also has good information for those of you running R on Windows 7, because Windows 7 does things a little differently from a permission perspective of doing this same upgrading, because I've used it on Windows XP and Windows 7, and it works fine both ways. But I would definitely check that out if you're running R on the Windows platform. So, wow, that was, that was a lot of information, definitely, about kind of this basic package management and I'll have posts on, on the show notes, or links, I should say, to other nice resources I found that also detail kind of what I've been verbalizing, as well as, of course, I've made a small script about doing these um, package management functions that I mentioned on, on the GitHub page as well. And I just, you know, go ahead and check it out. And this the reason I did this episode now is because in the next episodes and beyond, I'm going to be utilizing a lot of these add-on packages to show all of you some really innovative ways of using R and more importantly, making things easier for you, especially for those of you that are new to it, of getting some really innovative analysis or even data importing done. So I wanted to make sure I got this episode in so that all of you had a good idea of how do you actually get these packages and install them on your system. But like I said, this is definitely one of my favorite features of using R. So I really wanted to get this in before we went much further. So with that, I think it's going to be time to wrap this up. Yeah, I'd like to close by saying, of course, I welcome all of your feedback as always. So please keep sending that along my way um, to the rcast at gmail.com. Also, as I mentioned before, I'm still looking for that audio feedback. And I'm hoping that this new feature I propose called Listener Tips will, you know, enable us to really, you know, get some really nice listener tips in audio format. And as I said, definitely use our, our voicemail line. Our voicemail line is at plus one two six nine eight four nine nine seven eight zero, and that's of course on our our home site at r podcastorg and you'll also see the direct link to use Google to automate the calling process. And I mentioned before, um, in the recent episode, we have a page on Google Plus that also has show updates and the posts from the main website. And you'll see a direct link to that on the home site, our podcast dot, our r-podcast.org. Definitely please stay subscribed via the RSS feeds and also via iTunes or whatever format you, you're listening with. 
And we also have show updates on our Twitter account. Our handle is at the RCast. Definitely, as I said, I'm really enjoying the interaction I'm having, and I'm hoping we get some some great tips in the future. So this has been Episode 5 of the R Podcast. So until next time... End of line.